Hi there, Gigi from the RBA. In this video, we're going to talk about how we can think about economic growth using a demand and supply framework. In a related video on GDP, we discussed how GDP expenditure measures the total amount of spending on goods and services in the economy over a period of time. We can separate the spending in GDP into different categories – consumption, investment, government spending and exports and imports. You might have seen these at some stage and you can find more details on these types of spending and what influences them in the explainer on economic growth. Now GDP is a statistical estimate of a concept that economists call aggregate demand. Aggregate in this instance means total. Now based on our definition, think of aggregate demand as the total amount of Australian goods and services purchased by Australian households, businesses and governments over a period of time. Exports are foreign households, businesses and governments purchasing Australian goods and services and imports are Australian households, businesses and governments purchasing foreign goods and services. Someone has to supply these goods and services and this is where aggregate supply comes in. Aggregate supply is the total production of goods and services in the economy. The production of goods and services, or what we call outputs, is determined by how many inputs are available to produce them and how efficiently these inputs are used. So there are two main types of inputs, labour and capital. Labour is the efforts of workers to produce goods and provide services. Capital are the inputs that we can measure that are not labour, like machines and buildings. These are the tools that are used alongside labour to produce something. For example, I'm using a laptop to produce this video. So there's a third aspect of aggregate supply that's called productivity. Productivity captures everything else apart from labour and capital that's involved in turning inputs into outputs. It's any inputs that we can't measure, say things like innovation, and it's also how efficiently inputs are turned into outputs. Think of productivity like this. Labour and capital inputs are used to produce a good or service, which is an output. Productivity determines how much output you can get from a given amount of inputs. All else equal, higher productivity means more output can be produced from the same amount of inputs, or it could be that less inputs are required to produce the same amount of output. That's all I'll say about productivity in this video. If you want to learn more, there's an explainer on productivity, which I've left a link for in the description. Now, changes to labour, capital and productivity will change aggregate supply. All else equal, more labour and capital inputs and higher productivity will mean more output of goods and services and therefore higher aggregate supply. So we have two concepts we've defined, aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Let's now put them together using a diagram. So in this diagram we have GDP on our x-axis and we have prices on our y-axis. Prices you can think of as the general level of prices in the economy. We have our aggregate supply curve, which is the upward sloping line there, and think of the aggregate supply curve as the total willingness of everyone in the economy to produce goods and services. This is like the sum of everyone's individual supply curve. And the reason that it's upward sloping is because you'd be willing to produce more if you can sell it for a higher price. On the other hand, the aggregate demand curve, which is the downward sloping line, is the total willingness of everyone in the economy to purchase goods and services. This is the sum of everyone's individual demand curves. It's downward sloping because you'll be willing to buy more goods and services when the price is lower. So on this diagram, we can define something called the level of potential output or potential GDP along the vertical dashed line. Think of potential GDP as a state of the economy where the amount of goods and services being demanded is the same as what can be supplied when the labour and capital inputs in the economy are fully utilised. Now, the definition of fully utilised may be a little different to what you might be expecting. When labour and capital inputs are fully utilised, it doesn't mean that they're producing the maximum amount of output possible. It just means that all of the available inputs are being utilised at their normal levels to produce output. Now what this means is the economy could temporarily supply more goods and services than, than is implied by potential GDP, say to meet an increase in aggregate demand. But it can't keep this up forever. 
For example, somebody could temporarily work 15 hours a day to increase their output if they were really busy, but they probably couldn't do this forever. Now, we could show an increase in aggregate demand on our diagram by shifting the aggregate demand curve to the right. We would end up at a new point, uh, GDP star and P star. This is a scenario of excess demand, where actual GDP is more than potential GDP. Supply can temporarily increase to meet the extra demand, but as a result, there's upward pressure on prices. Prices increase because it might cost more to produce things when the economy is beyond full utilization. For example, some people get paid overtime when they work extra hours. It could also just mean that there aren't enough goods and services being supplied to meet demand, so people are willing to pay a higher price to secure the limited supply of something. But what if aggregate supply were to increase permanently, so that a higher amount of goods and services could be supplied when labour and capital inputs are fully utilised? This could occur if more labour or capital become available, say because the population grows or there is investment in new capital. It could also happen if productivity improves. This would increase the level of potential GDP in the economy for a given price level. Pause the video here and see if you can draw this on the diagram. That's right, so the aggregate supply curve and the vertical dashed line would shift to the right, and the level of potential GDP would increase, such that the price level remains the same. The economy can now sustain an increase in aggregate demand, like we saw earlier, without seeing upward pressure on prices. Try pausing the video again and seeing if you can add this to the diagram. That's right, so aggregate demand would shift to the right, as you can see, we're now at a permanently higher level of GDP, and prices remain stable, so long as the increase in aggregate demand and aggregate supply is roughly the same. So at this stage, we've only been talking about the economy at a point in time. We're now going to extend this to think about how the economy changes over time. That way we can think about how changes in aggregate demand and aggregate supply relate to economic growth. To do this, I'm going to introduce a framework called the business cycle, which shows how the relationship between aggregate demand and aggregate supply usually changes over time. So this graphic shows the business cycle. On the horizontal axis is time, and on the vertical axis is GDP. So we're looking at how the economy grows over time. The dark green line shows how actual GDP changes. Think about the change in this line as actual economic growth. The light green line is potential GDP, which is estimated by economists. Potential GDP is expected to increase over time, alongside permanent increases in aggregate supply. The change in potential GDP is called potential economic growth, or potential growth for short. Inflation, which is the change in prices over time, is expected to be positive, reasonably low and stable when the economy is growing at potential. Now, actual GDP tends to fluctuate around potential GDP in a cycle, as the economy goes through periods where aggregate demand grows faster than permanent growth in aggregate supply, and vice versa. This is called the business cycle. In these times, unemployment and inflation fluctuate as well. When aggregate demand grows much faster than aggregate supply, or actual GDP is increasing by more than potential GDP, there will be more demand for goods and services. Businesses will therefore require more labour inputs to produce them, and unemployment will fall. As we noted before, because there's excess demand, there will be upward pressure on prices, and therefore higher inflation. Vice versa when aggregate demand is growing more slowly than aggregate supply. The job of the RBA with monetary policy is to help smooth out this cycle, so that growth in actual GDP is as close as possible to growth in potential GDP. Remember we said that when actual GDP is close to potential GDP, then inflation is low, positive and stable. This is consistent with the RBA's target for inflation or of 2-3% per year on average over time. Having the economy grow close to potential is a goal of fiscal policy as well. Let's now use this aggregate demand aggregate supply framework to think about how COVID-19 has affected the economy. To do this, we'll return to our aggregate demand aggregate supply diagram. So initially you might think COVID-19 has simply represented a fall in aggregate demand. 
Aggregate demand has certainly fallen. Lockdowns were put in place and these restricted the normal activities and therefore spending of households and businesses. People significantly reduced their spending on things like eating out as they were required to stay home. Businesses decided not to invest as much because the future is just too uncertain for them. This all shifted the aggregate demand line to the left. And so GDP fell and there was downward pressure on prices. However, at the same time, many businesses closed because of the lockdowns. You could interpret this as the labor and capital that is usually available to produce goods and services becoming temporarily unavailable. Australia's borders also closed and that stops people from coming into Australia, including people who would have immigrated here. Immigration has traditionally been a large source of growth in Australia's population and therefore growth in labor inputs. Both of these factors represent a fall in aggregate supply. This would also see the aggregate supply line shift to the left. So from the diagram, you can see that GDP definitely falls because of COVID-19, but that the impact on prices and therefore inflation is not immediately obvious. It depends how large each effect is. The fall in aggregate demand though is likely to be larger than aggregate supply. So the aggregate demand curve will shift to the left by a larger degree than the aggregate supply curve shifts to the left. This would see downward pressure on prices and therefore lower inflation. The fall in aggregate demand is temporary. The economy will recover as people's lives get back to normal. Many of the factors that caused aggregate supply to fall are also temporary and they'll largely unwind. For example, many of the businesses that closed have reopened and they'll resume producing goods and providing services. Immigration and therefore growth in the available labor inputs will also resume at some point. So long as this fall in aggregate supply is temporary and all of the capacity to produce goods and services returns, this shouldn't impact potential GDP. So fiscal and monetary policies have been used to offset some of the fall in aggregate demand. And what they're trying to do is shift the aggregate demand line back to the right so it gets some of the way back towards where it started from. In the case of fiscal policy, the government has provided money to households and businesses to encourage them to spend on consumption and investment. It's also involved the government to spend, promising to spend money on things directly like health, education and infrastructure. In the case of monetary policy, the RBA has lowered the interest rates that households and businesses pay to borrow money and committed to keeping these interest rates low. This will support all of the components of aggregate demand. Other policies introduced by the government will also help aggregate supply return to its pre-COVID level more quickly than otherwise. For example, this could be policies that help keep employees related to businesses so that labour inputs are available to reduce, uh, resume production more quickly once lockdowns finish. It could also include pro policies that boost productivity. But it's hard to know how quickly aggregate demand and aggregate supply will return to normal again and what the new normal will even be. Will households and businesses make spending decisions in the same way as they did before COVID-19? We don't know. So I'll leave it there with that as something for you to ponder and hopefully this has given you a good framework to analyze how economic growth is determined and how it changes over time. See you next time.